Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this, which is uh, the first of a series of podcasts in uh, Crowder's Beyond Boundaries uh, series of content. So this is a, a whole series of content that looks at innovation uh, at Crowder, how it's affecting the business, how it's affecting the people in the business and how it's affecting customers uh, as well. And today we're going to kick things off by looking at uh, data and analytics, which is a huge topic at Crowder uh, and has been for some time now. Um, and uh, we're going to start by introducing the people who are who are on this call um, and speaking to you as part of this podcast. So first of all, we have Marie Banks and Marie is the IT strategy planning and delivery director at Croda. Uh, we've also got uh, Danny Massey, uh, data science business analyst at Croda. Hello. And uh, Alexander Semenov, data science team lead at Croda. Yeah, hello, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us on, on a very cold and frosty morning. Um, so where I think we want to start is, is is first of all to understand in the sector as a whole whether whether data, particularly in and the analytics side of data, is is playing a big role. I mean, you know, Marie, maybe you can look at this. The 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 chemicals sector and the, the chemically derived ingredients sector doesn't seem to be a, a particularly data savvy environment, but but maybe that's just my perception. Is it? I mean, it absolutely is. I think, to be honest, that's been growing, Richard, over the last few years. The introduction of new technologies, particularly in the last 12 months with things like AI, have really seen an acceleration. And I think most businesses have started to look at how they can use data and, and analytics and data science to improve their business. And Crowd is no different. You know, in reality, I joined the business about seven months ago to bring more focus into this area. But it, we, we'd already started on our journey with data science, and whether that's around product and, and finding new products, whether that's around efficiency and, and, and supporting our employees or delivering a better customer service with the types of product we sell and how we bring that to life in market. Data science has a real part to play, both in, inside Croda and in the wider life science and consumer care businesses. So, so from your perspective, data science has, has already become a really important part of life at Croda. Absolutely. De definitely, without doubt. And and does that flow over into kind of your experience, Danny and Alexander? You know, you guys are obviously really at the, the heart of the implementation of a lot of data projects by the sound of it. Are you seeing a shift in, in Croda's own use of data over the last sort of two or three years? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it is just becoming more important. I think decision makers in the company need answers to questions that can only be answered through the data. Um, I think the the complexity of the questions that we're being challenged with by decision makers and leaders within the company has changed as well. We've been asked more complex questions, so rather than looking back and say, okay, what, what did happen? It's, we're getting asked, okay, so what's going to happen in the future or how do we, how do we make something happen? So I think, yeah, the, the, the challenges we're facing are getting more complex and we need different skills and tools to be able to answer them. And at the same time, you know, being maybe more technical, we still generate, we do generate more and more data every single year. Maybe the amount of data we generate doubles, or I don't know, maybe triples. And therefore we have to, yeah, see that not as a problem, but a huge opportunity for us to extract additional value to see and uh, possibilities for meaningful insights in all this data. And it might be done for, yeah, pure business uh, related projects or activities, but at the same time when we develop new products to satisfy the needs of our customers as well. Okay. A good point, actually. If I can, Richard, just one point to add on to that. I think in reality, if you look at the day-to-day -day world as consumers, we've all got used to having more data. We can see how our lives have become more intuitive because companies are using that data more. And Croge is no different. We want to offer the best customer service. We want to offer our customers the best products. And the easiest way to do that is to use the data richness that we have already in our business. And I think I think that point's interesting because I... I understand, Danny, that, that you've not come a natural route into data and analytics. So you've kind of come from a, a completely different background. You must have you must kind of embody that change that's been going on at Croder a bit. So just just run through how you got into this role, because it's 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 quite interesting, I think. 
Yes, I, I don't think my path's been a, a, a typical one, um, in Croda by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I started working at Croda over 15 years ago. Um, at the time I started working on our, our site services team. So this was in 2008. I was fresh from the, um, a, my sitting gills level two plumbing certificate. Um, and then started working in the site service team through, um, through that I started working through the marketing team and helping them at exhibitions, setting up the, the stands. Um, I ended up getting a job in marketing as a marketing administrator at first, then becoming a, a marketing coordinator. And it's then that I've really sort of fell in love with data. So I was analyzing um, all of the website interactions that we have with customers and trying to find opportunities in there and sort of building reports and dashboards in Excel. And it was about that time that um, the company invested in a business intelligence platform and was able to sort of build better solutions that we could um, deploy to, to more people in our business intelligence platform. Um, yeah, kind of fell in love with building dashboards and uh, insightful visualizations. And then when the opportunity came up to move to the uh, data and analytics team, um, yeah, I couldn't wait to apply, managed to get that job there. And then that was about five or six years ago. And then over the course of that time, Crowd have been experimenting more in data science and Alexander um, joined the company. And we started collaborating on projects and now it's kind of my, my primary focus is on building business intelligence tools still, but that incorporate data science and, and machine learning into them. And so, yeah, because Ale Alexander, you came a more traditional route, didn't you? You came a more academic route. Yeah, in this case, my, my route was quite boring. You know, I spent 10 years in academia doing my PhD and, you know, teaching students and, you know, carrying out uh, experiments. But at the same time, uh, and then again, around 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, I joined Croda. But what I would like actually to add uh, to the story of Danny, that in reality, when you do data science, you realize quite quickly how flexible and, you know, agile you have to be with the project. So maybe actually the story of Danny shows uh, and highlights, you know, how you have to uh, approach such, such data scientific projects, because, you know, when you are flexible, when you when you are ready to change and maybe move from one topic to another topic and so on, then you can, in my opinion, become successful in data science. Because again, data science itself is an uh, advanced tool and nothing actually else. Yes, there are, you know, a lot of complexities behind that. But one of the main feature and that what I've learned, you know, by doing quite a few successful and unfortunately not so successful projects once in a while that you have to be agile in your mind by, you know, uh, learning new things when someone comes uh, this a project or a question and then you literally have no idea how to approach it but by doing you know uh, actually quite usual things studying the topic how you know where you can find and in which way you can find the solution then you see the opportunities and that's what i think that uh then is a great example who by moving from different sectors and from different roles, he was actually more than happy and ready to go for that. Because again, trust me, I have talked to, I have uh, discussed the same topic with quite a few people in the past and many people just react when you tell them like, okay, data science is so cool and a lot of opportunities <laughs> and so on. But at the same time, it is quite tough and challenging. And many people react like, okay, I have my uh, sector where I do know uh, things, how they work and so on, I will rather stay there. And in data science, it doesn't really work. You really have to be very flexible. I think that's one thing that Alex has taught me as well about that flexibility and being able to apply skills in different areas. I remember one, one thing that Alexander said, well, it's working on projects like this, it's, it's half, data science and half art almost sometimes <laughs> where you have to think up new creative ways to do things and generate new features within the data it's a big part experimentation and creativity 
uh, and, and an equal part science. Exactly. It's lovely, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's really lovely, actually, because if you think about Crowder's own growth, how Crowder has grown, it's been very entrepreneurial. And I think this is a really good example of how data is now following that same path that a lot of Crowder's growth has taken. So it's great for its people and it's also really great for our service to our business and our customers. So so why don't we use that as a bit of a jumping off point to look at what what Crowder is able to do now that it probably wasn't able to do a few years ago. And I'm not thinking about specific examples, but we will come on to that. But in terms of the type of areas that it can operate in, the type of services it can provide, the type of support it can offer both to its people and its customers, you know, what is what has changed in terms of the things that the company can do um, over the last few years? And now it has not only a different perception of, of, of data as a valuable capability but but the team you know the team to do that um and i'm going to put that over i'm actually i'm going to put that over to marie just just because i think from a bird's eye perspective you're you're going to have that view aren't you yeah absolutely and i think in reality there's probably four key areas we can now the technology is rapidly grown so it now enables us to become much more predictive the key art in business is to manage the demand that you've that you you've sold so what do your customers need with the supply your resources to deliver that and for me data science and particularly artificial intelligence is really supporting our predictive capabilities about what we have to produce when for our customers and it's a game changer in our business model um From a people perspective, it really helps to understand our people's journeys. You know, are we losing people if we are? When are we losing them? How do we retain them? So that kind of ethos about making our people's day-to-day working as well, much, much easier. Um, From a customer perspective, it helps us to look at our products. It helps us to innovate. It helps us to understand where are our products being used in the world? Where didn't we know that? Where can we accelerate um, sales? Where can we support our business development teams? And it really supports a huge ecosystem for us, whether that's from procurement and uh, and purchasing raw materials and the price that we pay compared to the price in market. It really provides game changing technology in how we manage our overall business operations. So those kind of things weren't available to us. I don't think they were available to anybody, actually, you know, over the last few years. It's been such an accelerated um, development, but it's really wonderful that the investments Crowder's made have put us in a great position to unlock that type of technology because of the skills that we have today in our business. And it's definitely that investment in people, isn't it, Maria? I think so. Now we've got yeah. sp- specialist teams, we've got special data science teams, analytics teams, data management teams, and and specialist roles within them as well. To yeah, to try and sort of unlock some of the some of the value that's in our data. Certainly on people, if you think about it, part of it's about our our people understanding the opportunity that data brings. So that kind of data literacy in the business. And actually, I I go back to the examples of what happens in day to day world. You know, if I shop on Amazon and I buy one thing and Amazon then tell me, oh, you've just bought this. Would you like to buy this? Seeing that example of data science and actually artificial intelligence driving you to buy product inspires our people to think differently. And that for me is the role of Danny, my myself and Alexander to get our people engaged in data. Let's look at some of those those real world examples from Crowder and and I'm going to push this over to Alexander because um, I was told about some some work that that you led specifically um, about increasing crop yields in um, in in when when um, growing tomatoes you know for farmers who are growing tomato plants Um, and and the way in which that's done sounded fascinating so can you just give us an overview of that particular example of the kind of introduction of data and analytics into what would seemingly be a non-data driven environment and uh, the example I'm going to tell, I think also a great, you know, possibility to see, you know, interesting opportunities in the situations where people might think that, okay, you know, it's just a problem that cannot be solved. And here's an example I'm going to give uh, the following situation that uh, our customers, and we are talking right now about uh, seed enhancement sector, a part of our life sciences, uh, where uh, our customers uh, 
grow seeds to be sown. But at the same time, of course, when you uh, want to distribute them, let's say to the farmers, you have to provide a certain level of quality. And then uh, obviously seeds or plants, they're living organisms. You cannot really that easily control what will happen. So sometimes you uh, invest a lot of resources, manpower, a huge amount of money. And here we are talking maybe in this case about tomato, but then you produce a big seed lot, uh, millions and millions of seeds, but then the quality is below uh, market standards. And what should you do? In the past, uh, the seed lot just, you know, has to be thrown away and or, you know, uh, distributed with completely different uh, levels of, uh, I would call it, uh, uh, yeah, let's say price uh, with a different price or sometimes cannot be used at all. But then uh, you realize that there are still uh, quite a few possibilities uh, when we apply some advanced technologies and here's the following solution we created for such customers. Why not to uh, develop a machine that can scan every single seat and then try to predict the possibility for every single seed to germinate, to be a good seed. So if we do uh, generate such predictions, we can actually try to separate good and bad seeds. So uh, was that uh, kind of ambitious project? Definitely yes, especially, and that's an important topic I think we will uh, talk through a bit later when people don't really believe that much in such possibilities, it is very hard to push it through, but we still managed. And now we have a machine that works 24 seven, actually several machines and it uh, tremendous, it is a tremendous help for our customers because the seat lot that would not be, you know, good enough in the past can suddenly reach uh, market standards and uh, uh, become of uh, just a high quality seat lot. And here's a very nice, you know, funny addition for all of us to remember that uh, one kilo of seeds is more than 50 K uh, pounds. So it is really extremely expensive and even more expensive than one kilo of gold. It's it's amazing to me that, that, that um, you know, you go and buy tomatoes at the supermarket and you don't uh, you don't really associate them with either of these things the, the kind of price involved in 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 the seeds that they come from and the technology involved in getting them there as well i mean it sounds like really complicated machine vision technology exactly uh, yeah is this is this technology that's come from another environment or is it technology that was built and developed for this kind of data ai driven approach within croda is also a good example why you still have to, you know, not just maybe directly try to apply different technologies, but I, I would even say dream about different possibilities mm -hmm. and uh, opportunities. Because if you look on the technology we used for uh, seed sorting, uh, it comes kind of directly from the same technology, for example, being used in uh, in cars like Tesla, where they use also machine vision to, and uh, you know, just to find the proper route and where to drive and so on. But again, if you look on such technologies from other perspectives and you see and you try to uh, envision new possibilities, you realize that they suddenly might be or quite unexpectedly might be used in other areas as well. So that's, for me, that's... this is the most like of all, all the use cases uh, that we've utilized AI, this for me is the most inspiring. And it's, it's, it's obviously the benefits that we can pass on to the customers, almost like a guaranteed yield in the, in the seeds that we pass on to our customers, but it also has other benefits. So less land is needed um, to sow the, uh, the same amount of crop and get the same, same yield. And that kind of aligns with our, our principles as a, as a company as well. 
to be climate land and, and people positive. I think it's a really good point, Danny. The the use of data science to to support our corporate vision around sustainability. You know, Alexander's point is a really great use case from from supporting our customers and providing better products. But actually, it really supports our own sustainability principles. And in fact, data science and we, we've used that for our customers in terms of understanding the carbon footprint of products and being able to allow our customers to see that. So it, it's really wonderful that you see your corporate principles come into life through data science. It's brilliant. That's a good that's a good example um, of having an impact on on kind of customers. But my understanding is that there's been a big impact um, on the work to support the business as a whole, both people and the company. So maybe we can look at a, a couple of those. I mean, um, Danny, you were you were talking about um, customer retention um, uh, at one point. Can we just delve into that? Because that is a good example of where data and analytics has really had a tangible impact on on the business's performance, isn't it? Yep. So every business sees a, a certain amount of churn sort of losing customers or losing specific pieces of business with a customer. Um, and over the last couple of years, Crowder aren't, aren't unique in some of the, the supply issues we've had um, and meeting demand and other, other sort of macro factors that have affected us. Um, and what we wanted to do is build a system that would predict when a customer might not purchase from us, when we might be about, uh, about to lose some business. And what that allows us to do is is predict which um, which piece of business we may lose, and then investigate why that is. So maybe there could be some problem. There could be some um, some way when not meeting their their needs as effectively as, as we as, as we could be. So we can identify we alert the sales team when we might be about to lose some business, and that allows those uh, those departments to be more proactive. Um, to reach out, make contact with the customer and just ask if everything's OK, if they're happy with the service we're providing and essentially, you know, mitigate that risk. It's a great, it's a great example, Danny, and it's something that, you know, has really, really supported our business in the last 12 months, especially retaining business. So it's a really, really good example of where we've been able to use that analytics capability, especially with data science. It is, and it's a, another good example of Alexander and I collaborating. So I think before this use case, Alexander had worked on mainly R and D and and sort of more science heavy use cases, whereas I had more experience um, with commercial data. So by combining our our sort of experience and expertise in those areas, we'll be able we're able to build a really effective tool. It's one of those tools as well, when you build, it shows the business the capability through data science and it excites people and it, it makes their imagination spark. So I think, you know, building things like that to, that touch quite a lot of our functions, whether it's sales, business development, customer service, they start to see the art of the possible with data. And that's our job as well, not just to deliver the day to day, but to show them things that are out of the possible for them to then start to think about, well, could you do this? Is it possible to do this? So it's a really, really good, good example of how we can do that. That question about is it possible is is quite a nice lead into um, the example that we've also talked about around formulation and how that has started to change at Croda as well, because obviously formulating new ingredients, new compounds, new materials is is a hugely challenging and laborious process or has been, you know, but that's changed now, hasn't it? We're starting to change. Does someone want to talk about that example? Because that's a really good one. Yeah, so we Danny, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so some um, scientists in a certain area of the business came to us probably about 18 months ago. Um, and the problem was it takes an incredible uh, amount of time to, to build up test results for hundreds or thousands of formulations. So the problem with this particular use case was um, formulations for uh, various different combinations of surfactants. And they wanted to test various different formulations to see how much, um, let's say, how, how foamy that product would be, what the cleansing qualities would be, and how, how mild it would be on the skin. Now, at first, the, um, the, the, the scientists we were talking to, they came with about 40 test results. 
and said, okay, can we can we use this data set to predict what the properties of, of thousands of different formulations would be? I think the, the challenge there was the amount of data. We didn't necessarily have enough to build an effective model, but we were we were able to fail fast on that one and say, well, no, to be honest, we, we can't with this. But if we had a bigger data set and tests conducted in the, in the right way, then there's potential here. So more tests were conducted. We built up a bigger uh, training data set. And then at the second time round, we were able to build some really effective models that gave some, some great results. And then there's there's obvious time savings there. It means a scientist can can use this tool as a as a first screening, just to see if the the um, the test they were going to um, do was worthwhile. So it, it, it's it's going to be able to cut down on a lot of scientists' time, um, and and the obvious benefits that we get from that. And perhaps even maybe in the future, this could be a tool that our our customers could use as well, as a as a a, a first step in building their own formulations. Thank you. That's, that 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 just kind of shows, I think, the span of where the impact is happening. We've talked about the business as a whole. We've talked about people's processes in the business. We've talked about customer benefits and 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 all, and, and particularly that customer benefit linked to broader societal and sustainability benefits as well. There's obviously a huge spread of impact. Um, question for you though, Alexander, which is about you know what you see outside of the walls of Croda. So, is what Croda's doing unusual in this kind of sector? Um, is it doing things that other companies aren't doing, or is this a kind of cross-sector move to embrace the power and potential of data? So, uh, seeing uh, what is happening and can uh, the companies that are more or less alike as uh, Croda, what I can say, and again, having also quite a big community of other people who do comparable things, what I can uh, 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 focus on uh, on two things, I really believe they're very special for Croda. And the first one is cross-functional collaboration because it's really great example. And uh, we somehow have discussed that already, uh, uh, for example, when Danny has highlighted a couple of examples, because again, I represent R&D. And uh, for example, when in, in usual, uh, in companies, I would say this usual structure, you can expect when someone approaches a person from R&D with the projects related more to the marketing or business intelligence and so on, let's say it is a hard stop. But in our case, we still managed to find, you know, really great collaboration and see how we can benefit from our uh, yeah, unique set of skills. For example, you know, obviously you can imagine, and that's what I usually say that, you know, my understanding of the business kind of uh, uh, is limited to uh, my yeah to uh, doing uh, internet banking or doing groceries, but having the right people around who are ready and willing to help and support you to explain things, you can actually reach a great uh, synergistic effect. I would call it like that, and that's yeah we have uh, already done a couple of big and really influential projects where uh, my team again, officially focusing on biology and chemistry, can collaborate greatly with uh, the team that is officially is focused uh, more on business intelligence and not really on, you know, things like formulation and so on. So that's the first thing. And the second one, uh, it will work well only if you're agile and you are ready to support each other and that what i think uh yeah i definitely uh, have seen many many times in our company yeah totally agree it's kind of the the culture and that collaboration and we we need to work with those subject matter experts in the business and we, we can't work in in isolation i mean we could try but we wouldn't produce anything good so we really rely on, on on that expert knowledge, which our uh, which our people have. And yeah, it never really ceases to amaze me how how knowledgeable and experienced some of these guys are. And working together, you know, we can do really really good things. 
And, and Marie, I suspect that it's your very simple task then to just uh, ensure that this level of collaboration and agility happens. Absolutely. You know, we have three corporate principles which are responsible, innovative and together. And to me, data science talks ex exactly to those three principles. We want we want to lead our industry. We want to be the best at what we do. And I, I absolutely see that data science is the thing that can give us that competitive edge. It can help us be the leader in all these areas. And we're really well placed to do that as a collaborative team. OK, so just to kind of finish off the conversations, we've covered quite a lot of stuff already. Uh, let's take a look forward. So question for you, Marie, um, you're obviously looking at things from a kind of strategic and planning perspective. Um, so what are Crota's ambitions for data and um, and analytics and data science in the future? Where Where is it going to take everything that it's learned and undertaken so far? And where's it going to be applied next? Well, I make no apology for saying that I, I see we have a really phenomenal future with data science. I think I think it is absolutely a game changer for us. The speed that technology is changing is is really unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen anything grow so quickly as the speed that things like artificial intelligence is growing. We will absolutely exploit that to really support leveraging and accelerating digital ambition in our business. We want to be the best that we can do and data science will, for me, for me, I believe, unlock that power. And Danny and, and Alexander, you guys are on the ground delivering a lot of this work. Um, where do you hope that data science uh, will 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 go in Crota? What are the what are the ambitions that you guys have over the next year or so? Yeah, well, it, it's hard to say almost, isn't it? Because in in AI, things are moving so quickly. Um, it's hard to say what tools are going to be available to us in in two years' time. Um, I think we need to be reactive. To, to what's happening and to technological developments. Um, you can't look anywhere without reading about generative AI at the moment. So I think our, our challenge will then be to, how do we use that? It's about finding the most valuable use cases um, and then trying to match the right technology and the right tools to those use cases to, to, to give the, the right results. So I think that there's definite potential in generative AI, um, building chatbots, you know, trying to surface some of that knowledge that is it's in people's heads within the business. But can we can we use that to help answer customer questions? And for me, it is great to see that, you know, we do have uh, data science is recognized as a strategic in, uh, in, importance for Croda that, uh, yeah, that's the asset that uh, should and will drive uh, our business innovation. So for us, for maybe more technical people, it is important to stay uh, uh, aware of all uh, things that are happening around, uh, continue seeing the opportunities with the new, let's say, algorithms and other technologies, state, uh, state of the art technologies. And again, be flexible enough to see sometimes unexpected opportunities uh, where the technologies, let's say, uh, so-called uh, large language models uh, being developed for the sectors that are not really naturally related to the chemical business, you have to be able to see uh, such opportunities for your own company. If I can just build on that, Richard, as well, just to say one final point. One of the things that we've been really great at doing is proving pedigree through data science. So we, we've established a great capability for our business that I have no doubt will help us disrupt and, 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 and change our business model moving forward for the better. So I think we've positioned ourselves in a really great place to lead our industry on data science. It does sound it does sound like this is very much the start of the journey, not even the middle and, and nowhere near the end. So that that's that that's a that's a very exciting starting point from which people can hopefully um, consider where Crota is going to take uh, data in the future. Um, uh, we'd like to thank 
uh, you guys for for taking the time to talk us through it. It's really, really exciting area. So thank you, Marie. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Much appreciated. This has been the first of a series of podcasts uh, and indeed a series of broader content going live around uh, the Croda Beyond Boundaries uh, campaign, which looks at innovation at, at Croda and how it's affecting customers people and the business as a whole you can find out more if you uh, enjoyed this podcast at uh, www.croda.com there is a whole section on data and analytics within the innovation area of the website um, and there will be more uh, content to come uh, on the beyond boundaries campaign um, over the course of the next few months uh, for the moment thank you very much guys um, have a very good rest of your day and to everybody who's taken the time to listen to this thank you very much uh, for your time to explore the subject with us Thanks, Thank Richard. you. Thank you.